Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this very special occasion, the launch of Merrin Glovers of Stone and Sky. Um, it's been lovely to hear you all at the very, very um, outset of the evening. Great. It's a very warm welcome to you all from, I know you're coming from all over the world and we've seen, seen you in the chat. So my name is Peggy Hughes and it's just a great pleasure uh, to host this occasion and to get to talk about this absolutely beautiful book by Merrin. I'm just going to hold it there. I hope you can see it. There it is, the beautiful cover by Abigail Salveson. Um, to answer the question on everyone's lips from the very get-go, the books are available to buy uh, from Merrin's local bookshop. That's the bookmark of Granton. Um, and we'll, we'll be popping the information in the chat and on a slide at the end as well. But you can visit the website. That's the bookmark.co.uk where you can buy the book. I think you should definitely have at least three copies, to be honest. Um, so I think you're all muted now. I was just going to remind everyone just to cut out any little background noises. But anything that occurs as we go along, please do pop it in the chat and tell us, as I say, where you're coming from. It's lovely to know. Um, format wise, we've got, as you've seen, we've got a little bit of film and a little bit of music and sound and vision. Uh, we're going to have a chat, Maren and I, about this stunning book. Maren's going to do a couple of little readings as well. And then we'd very much love it if you would come in with your questions and comments again, um, ideally via the chat box and we'll get to those before we finish. And I did want to flag that even uh, when the sort of formal part of the evening is over, there will be a chance for you to stay on the call and join Maren for a little bit more of an informal chat as well. Uh, so that's sort of the, the etiquette and format. I will whisk you through a little intro to the book and then we'll hear from Maren, uh, the woman of the hour. But here we go. So shortlisted already for Book of the Year by the Bookmark Book Festival and reviewed in The Scotsman by Alan Massey as a considerable achievement, a rich stew of a novel, one with a Victorian complexity of plot, a family saga, which is also a socio-economic economic survey of Highland history. This book charts the adventures of the, of the Monroe family. After Shepherd, Colvin Munro disappears, a mysterious trail of his 12 possessions leads into the Cairngorm Mountains. His foster sister Mo and prodigal brother Sorley are driven to discover the forces that led to his disappearance. As a former church minister and current owner of the Ferryman Inn, Mo thinks she knows everyone's story. Colvin's traveler mother, alcoholic war scarred father, Bolivian wife, musician daughter, bird obsessed son, his friends and foes. Sorely returning home from his life in the city brings unsettling revelations. So this is a story that embraces the entire community, its history and the landscape that shapes them. Spanning almost a century, the novel is a pay on to the connections between people, their land and way of life, a profound mystery, a political manifesto and a passionate story of love and loss and redemption. It is shot through with wisdom and humor and if that I mean if that doesn't sell it to you absolutely beautiful you're in for a treat if you've not read it yet Marin we're going to hear a little reading in a little minute but first of all I just want to kick off if we may could you set the scene for us in terms of the writing of this novel where did it come from how long has it been cooking tell us a little bit more um, thanks, Peggy, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It's been absolutely hysterical hearing you tried to figure out how to use Zoom at the start. So, um, it's great to have you all on board, and uh, I hope everyone can see and hear uh, what's happening. Um, it's just great to have you coming along. Thank you. So in terms of the, the origins of the book, um, in one sense, it started for me on uh, the summer solstice, the shortest night of the year, uh, eight years ago, 2013, when I just woke up really early, 3 a.m., and after an hour of not being able to get back to sleep because there was this idea growing, I just went downstairs and started to write. And the, the, this is the piece of paper actually that I started to write on. Uh, and those first words were a story, a land, a people, this place of beauty and history of loss and hope, a shepherd. And it goes on from there. And, and that's really the point that it all grew out from and it was very slow in the growing and I went very deep and far and wide in the search to find this story and to tell it in the best way that I could. I see and we're going to hear a little bit I wonder could we have just a little bit of context about it's going to we're going to cut to another little little film uh, would you tell us what bit that's from Maren just to set the scene Okay, so the very first reading, I decided to pre-record it and um, actually do it on location. Um, 
And it is the opening page of the book and it's headed eulogy. Uh, and so it's not a spoiler to tell you that it is the eulogy um, for the shepherd Colvin at the heart of the story. And in a sense, the entire novel is framed by this eulogy that is given for him by the character Mo. And Mo is this foundling baby and she ends up being a kind of foster sister to Colvin. They're exactly the same age. They were born on the same night. And so she sort of is grafted into this community, to this family, but because of a tragic event has to flee. When she returns um, as minister, um, she can picks up her life again with this community. So she is giving the eulogy for him seven years after he's disappeared. And it's at this point really that she tries to tell the story, not just of Colvin, but of their whole community and how this terrible thing happened that he vanished. And her eulogy is in a sense, the story of the whole book and the way in which she holds it all together as she tries to, to look back and to remember and to piece together the parts of it. We are gathered here today on the shores of Loch Hope in the presence of God, in the worshipful company of birds and beasts on the hallowed ground of the earth to give thanks for the life of Colvin Munro. We do not know that he is dead and without certainty and without a body, we cannot perform last rites or lay him to rest. But we must release him and we must lay ourselves to rest. There is a time to bind, and there is a time to let go. But where to begin when it goes back so far? And where to finish when there is no end? In truth, this is the story of all of us. For we knew and loved Colvin, and we drove him away. Ah, yes, we have been haunted by that fear, haven't we? Was it me? Was it my fault? And through these years, you hoped I would say in soothing pastoral tones, no, of course not. It was nobody's fault, certainly not yours. Be at peace. But we could not find peace, could we? Because we were hiding behind shame and half lies when what we needed was to get to the heart of the matter. The truth, if you will. And I do not presume to know the whole truth, but I do know this story. I know it, for I am part of it, and because you have told me your parts. Slowly, painfully, in these seven years since Colvin disappeared, you have spilled your tales, mainly over drinks at the ferryman, swilling sorrows into your beer, sighing regrets on whiskey breath, confessing sins in the sipping of wine. And as the truth has come out, like bits of shrapnel from a wound, I have tried to piece it all together, to understand. Some of it will never make sense this side of the promised land, but of one thing I am certain. Colvin Munro is still alive. Shall we just have a vote and have Maren just read loads of the book to us instead of the chat we've got planned? That was absolutely lovely, Maren. I mean, I think you you sort of set us up there for what is the grand epic sweep of this novel in that in that reading there, the story of us and the and the time involved in everything. And this is of course not your first sort of dalliance with the epic. Can you start by telling us what draws you to that grand canvas that's in this novel and in your first novel as well? Yeah, um, interesting question. And I hadn't really kind of thought about it in those terms before, but the, the first novel for anyone that doesn't know is set in India, it's called The House Called Ascaval. And again, it spans you know, 70 years of India's recent history, going back to partition and independence and um, a contemporary time frame as well. So this novel has a contemporary time frame. And when I started to write it, I actually thought I was just writing a contemporary novel, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't have a historical element this time. 
but because right from the beginning, as you can see from the words that I wrote in the middle of the night uh, when I began, it was a story of the land. And I realized very quickly, if you're going to start writing a story of the land, uh, particularly in Scotland, um, the history is so much a part of that. And the more I understood about the history, the more that became a very live story for me that I wanted to include in the contemporary story that made sense of the contemporary story um, and actually explained or told the story of why we're here today with the land that we have and, 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 and the, the people the way they are and the land the way it is, yeah. How much does it throw you when uh, the book doesn't do what you think it's going to do. You just said you weren't going to have the historical and suddenly it, it, it makes itself absolutely apparent and necessary. What what, what happens then? Well, uh, yeah, and I find that's just very much a part of this process where uh, I think it was Iris Murdoch who said every novel is the death of a good idea, <laughs> something like that, that, that you, you begin with a conception, a, a, a sense of what you are going to write and what the story will be and how the shape the novel will take. And then as you enter into that process and that journey of it, all other kinds of things emerge and it becomes this process of really trying to find your way into it and through it and inevitably having to keep, keep changing what that conception is and having to work with the, the material that emerges and the, the characters that become important to you and letting go of the ones that no longer belong. So, I mean, anyone that knows you will know I'm, I'm a planner and I, I, will, I will have things sort of sketched out uh, as a way forward that I think I'm going to go, but inevitably it doesn't, it doesn't work out that way. It keeps changing. Um, and so that can at times be a real crisis because I can hit points of just thinking, this is not what I thought it was. So what is it? Um, whose story is this? It's something I kept asking myself a, a lot of the way through. Um, because in a sense, although it's about Colvin, he's a very quiet character. And so in a sense, he's the still center around which a lot of the story rotates. But the character of Mo uh, wasn't even there in the beginning, but she emerged as an increasingly important person to the extent that she is the primary narrator and in lots of ways I kept thinking this is Mo's story and it in lots of ways it is too but as she says at the beginning this is your story and our story it's all of our stories and that's because being a story about land it's also very much a story about the community um, the people that have lived here and shaped it and shape one another and there is no single story in a community. Yo, yeah, oh, we're already we're already in cow. Okay, so with the cow, we've talked a little bit there about Colvin and Colvin and Moo. I love Mo just by the by. We will come back to her in more detail. Um, but tell us about the other um, Munro brother. There's a, and maybe flesh out a couple of because it is a big cast. That's something I want to talk to you about as well. So maybe a bit more of a yeah, a sense of who's who would be good. Okay, so. Um... Colvin Munro is the last of a long line of shepherds in the community. And his father um, went away to the war uh, and was very damaged by being a prisoner of war for four years, uh, came back and has this lifelong battle with alcohol. Um, Colvin's mother uh, was a Highland traveler, um, part of the tradition of just walking the Highlands and uh, a whole way of life that has pretty much fallen away now. And she left that very nomadic way of life in order to marry this shepherd. And then 10 years younger than Colvin is Sorley, um, named Sorley McLean Munro by his mother after the poet whom she loved. Um, but she dies when Sorley is only five years old. And Mo, this sort of almost foster sister, effectively becomes a kind of second mother to him at that point. So she passionately loves this sort of part brother, part ch child of hers almost. Um, but he's, his whole experience of growing up on this farm, having lost his mother and the kind of deprivation and almost underlying violence of this life on the farm means he flees it as soon as he can um, when he's 17 and he's bright enough to go to university and determined he's not going to get stuck on the farm and goes away to make his fortune. 
And his entry into the novel kicks off really because he has made his fortune, but he's lost it in the financial crisis. And uh, that's when we get to it, that's the next reading really is the first point at which we meet sorely, um, at the point at which he's lost everything, um, which triggers his return to the farm um, where everyone thinks he's come back to help, but actually he triggers even greater crisis. Yes, no spoilers. I see Miller in the chat's only at page 59, so we cannot, uh, we, we will not give any spoilers um, at all. Um, but um, yeah, I want to, I want to ask a little bit about how, you know, with, I think with the book, one of the things that's come up in reviews as well is just how, how much we care for these characters, you know, I've already stated my, my love for Mo. And I think with, with that sort of, um, what you mentioned about the land in the past, we sort of need their their backstory and their 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 lives as children and their upbringing to make a sense of them as as adults. I wonder how you how you handle that, how you get into character development. If you could say a little bit more about that for us, uh, because I think they are the most important thing of a novel, um, the, the people, and that is what ultimately we will ever care about when we read a novel. I think is 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 the human story and being drawn into those stories. I think also when I'm often asking myself whose story this is, it's because I actually seek to try and get inside each one of those characters um, and try to imagine the experience from under their skin. And, and I, I wonder if part of it for me is because um, growing up, I absolutely loved theater. I did a lot of theater at school, a lot of acting and my original degree in Australia was, um, it was a, an education degree, but drama was one of my majors and we were doing productions and all those things. And in another life, I was going to be a, an actress, of course. But um, uh, so that never happened, but I think there's still a part of me that inhabits a character in the way an actor might about, and a lot of that is thinking about motivations and drivers and, um, what it really feels like to be in that space. And I've, I've written plays as well, so that I suppose also really fires that sense of what fuels a character, what is the, the real humanity about them, that no matter whether they are to some extent villainous or in another sense more saintly, we're all all of those things. And uh, understanding what makes people tick is what's most fascinating to me in, in life too in many ways and I suppose part of what I explore in stories. I think one of the thing, things that's explored in the novel um, is, is that sort of the, the place where people with different stories and different backgrounds and belief systems and contexts kind of come <laughs> together. Um, that seems like a very rich place for, uh, oh, there's thunder in Norwich. I do apologize in case you can hear that as well. Um, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about the richness of that, that sort of set of intersections and how you, how you handle it. It's handled with such delicacy and I think genuine curiosity on your part. So I'd love to hear more about, about that. Yeah, so I, when I started writing, it's quite hard to remember now exactly what I did know then in 2013. I already knew that this was quite contested territory landscape in Scotland, and I suppose particularly this one being a national park. But I didn't know particularly quite how complex those tensions were um, and the different perceptions about the land and what it's for and the different ways of in which people tell the story of the land and its history, the different ways in which people see it and experience it today. So I learned such a huge amount in, in that, um, the writing of it. And I know the old rule with writing is write what you know, uh, but I always find I write to find out. Um, I, I write because I don't know. And, and you, you mentioned curiosity. It's often because I'm really seeking to learn things that take me beyond myself. And so what I suppose living here has taught me and writing the novel has taught me is that it's all very, very complicated and people are very complicated and the narratives about the land are complex. And there's not, it's not a case of two different sides of the debate or even three sides or four sides. It, there, there's a struggle within most of the people that are trying to, to live with the land and engage with the land in different ways. So Colvin himself 
struggles with it. He struggles with this history and heritage of being the sheep farmer. He struggles with the chores of his day-to-day -day life. And he even says sometimes he doesn't know if he loves it or hates it. But there's a part of him that, that is just hefted to the hill like the sheep. There's a part of him whom this is his way of life and, and he couldn't be anything else. He's a shepherd. And it, it's so much a part of him that to, to lose that would be to lose a, an enormous sense of identity. So I think for a lot of the people in this landscape, I see that there is, there is identity and meaning in who they are and how they relate to the landscape, but also within families, within marriages, you will have very different ways of life. And it's not like you've got distinct and separate groups within the community. You have all these intersections and overlaps and paradoxes and incongruities in terms of the ways in which people relate to the landscape and to one another. And so those are the things that are interested me. And I suppose I, I wanted in the same way with character, trying to get under a skin and understand how people tick. I didn't want to have oversimplified and crude narratives around the landscape and the people that live here, but rather to try and really explore those nuances and those complexities and, and what happens when you, you, you bring all these different dynamics together. I want to stay with the land for a little a little bit there, Maren. You, you've um, touched on, we, we, right at the very start, we touched a little bit on the land and, and needing the past to be in there to really write it um, authentically and, and, and properly. Um, I just wonder, yeah, again, that sort of, um, that honouring both the, the workman-like um, sort of relationship to the land that you mentioned Colvin has, and also the sort of Queen Victoria endorsed shortbread tin Highland vision. Um, you know, yeah, you, you celebrate both. And I just wonder how you, how you, how you effectively did that. Because I, I imagine it's quite a tricky tightrope to, to, to make both glow, if you see what I mean. Yes, I mean, yeah, Queen Victoria does have a cameo moment in the novel, um, as you know, but uh, so what, Queen Victoria effectively did is, is created a, a kind of fiction around the Highlands that um, has been um, part of what drove the whole fashion for the Highland sporting estate. Um, and in many ways, part of what still drives the tourist industry up here. So to some extent, Highlanders are slightly saddled with that history and that interpretation of the Highlands but to another extent, they kind of need it because we need the tourists to come here. You know, so we need all the tartan and the thistle and, uh, and all those uh, and the shortbread tins. But there's elements of those things that, that are really part of life here. There, there is a, a piping culture, that there is a, a Scottish traditions um, which have become sort of packaged in certain ways for, for the tourist market perhaps to sell Scotland as a, as a product, but they're not entirely fictions. They, they are part of real life as well. So I think for me, it was partly about trying to drill down a bit to, to the realities of those things in, in, in real people's lives rather than just the, the sort of tourist brochure story about the Highlands. Um, and again, I suppose just having lived here for a while, which as someone who's moved so many, many times, having lived here for 15 years is a long time for me. And although I'm still an incomer in, 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 in local terms, it's been a real learning about all those dynamics that make, make for, for a real life here, um, behind all of the images, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think though you do you do kind of evoke the texture of place really really beautifully. I've got here page fifty seven, which is just one bit that stood out for me—a passage where the, a rainbow is refracting, and it's all really beautiful. I just wonder if you can you could say a little more about about translating the the sort of uh, yeah that that more than just uh, you know the sights and smells, but you really kind of like condense it onto the page for us there. How did it, what's your relationship, I suppose I'm asking with, with place, you've just touched on it um, in terms of living there uh, for 15 years. I mean, t tell us about your relationship, I suppose, to the, to the hills and, and, and all that's there. Yeah, um, an unfolding one, um, because again, I suppose because I moved many times, place is very important uh, to me and in my writing and exploring a sense of belonging with that. Um, 
And again, particularly with the understandings of the land, you know, the sense of does the land belong to people or do people belong to it? Um, and for me, ideas of belonging are not about ownership or having a long, long history with a particular place because I haven't had that. But for me, it's about going into places, particularly places of the natural world and feeling a sense of being at home because of the sense of beauty, because of the sense of, of life, of, of that is, um, you know, nature is never spent, as Jared Manley Hopkins said, that sense that there is a, a teeming um, vivacity there, that when I feel most at home in a place where there's a sense of things that are that are beyond me, that are growing and living and wild and um, and part of their own sort of struggles. So I think um, in the writing, there's that attempt to to re-inhabit those spaces. You know, writing is just flat words on a flat page, and so the challenge is to take yourself as a writer, but ultimately then to be taking the reader out through those words into this place that's so real for you in your experience that you want to transport people to that. Mm. You want to capture the essence of that somehow. Mm. And I imagine for you being, as you've just said, such an international writer, you've lived all over, you know, that, that your, your readers are, you know, you're both talking about Scotland to a Scotland, but also to a much wider, you know, we've seen everybody in the chat tonight from all over the world. So it sort of must be an interesting, yeah, uh, view, viewpoint to be imagining. Imagine. Yeah, and I, I think that's the other thing that's a, that's a challenge with a book like this because some of its subject matter is incredibly familiar to Scots and particularly mm -hmm. to Highlanders, mm -hmm. so particularly some of the elements of history. But I know that for a lot of my readers and for somebody like me coming to it, uh, you know, as, as a, an Australian um, brought, brought up in Asia, a lot of it was new. I didn't know it. Um, my husband's a Yorkshireman and he would say, well, a lot of people south of the border wouldn't know this either, you know, so seeking to tell a story in a way that doesn't feel redundant and, and over familiar to a Scottish audience, but actually is a new story for people uh, outside these borders. You know, that, that, that's a real challenge to, 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 to strike that level of kind of information and background. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I suppose I came to it with the sense of, well, what did I want to know? What did I want to find out um, when, when all this history was new to me? Yeah. Oh. Beautifully done. Um, I want to um, talk to you a little bit about the um, the, the structure that the book has, because that owes something, I think, to, to biblical and to, to sort of religious um, symbolism and metaphor. Um, so I'll, I'll, we'll speak a little bit about that, maybe. Um, but how did you hit upon this, the, the, the shifts in time and the narrative points of view? And as you mentioned before, the fact that we don't hear from Colvin really himself, he's viewed through the prism of other people's other people's view. How do you reach that that sort of mode, I suppose, of, of, of telling this? story um, in telling us it. Yeah, so structure was a, was a real challenge. Um, and I suppose because initially I thought it was a contemporary story. Um, and I thought that this time I might just start at a place and go forwards. Um, and that place that I thought I was going to start from is a scene in the pub, the local pub. And that is seen as right is now in the middle of the book. Um, so I suppose because of a recognition that there were all these different threads that needed to, to be woven together and trying to find, for me, the best way to do that meant ultimately there was a moving around in time. Um, and structurally, um, anyone that's read it will know that it's kind of threaded together with the finding of Colvin's 12 possessions that he leaves behind him when he disappears. And, and each of those possessions, they work in lots of different ways, but in, in, in essence, they, they take us into a new part of the story. They introduce us to people that were significant in his life or experiences or, or, or places. Um, and so they're working on quite a few different levels. Um, and, you know, looking back through my notebook, because I, I write with this notebook that kind of has notes and things as I'm going along and you know there was a point in there where I've obviously I can see that I've said aha why not try and thread it through with his possessions 
So that's that's one kind of structural device. Um, but also that it's broken into three books uh, through it, um, because each 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 part of those each book has its own kind of narrative arc um, as well. Um, and then each chapter has a has a name. So like my first book, that didn't happen. They were all just one chapter, one, two, three, and so. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, this book, each chapter has a name. And so in terms of um, the kind of biblical background, there is a, a sense in which I wanted to draw from some of those biblical narratives around land, because those are really important themes in the Bible. And I felt that they were really interesting themes to borrow from as a kind of meta narrative for this as well, in terms of ideas of promised land, ideas of exodus and liberation, um, and how Mo is in effect a, a contemporary Moses figure. Um, although a failed Moses figure, because she doesn't manage to take the people where, where she wants to, but I won't tell you more about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, oh, you know, I do, I do love Mo. Um, I mean, why, why, what, what, what does the, the Bible, why are you, the, the, there's faith, there's Mo as the minister, there's a lot of rich kind of, um, you know, reference to the Bible and they're the prodigal son sorely that we've already mentioned. What does, why does your work owe, owe that, uh, what does, what, what am I trying to say? Why is it there? What does that mean to you? Why is there a context to to that interest and that uh, drawing on that? I suppose. Yeah. Well, well, I have a faith myself, and the Bible was was the kind of meta narrative that I've grown up with, and um, and it's uh, it's a story that I I keep returning to, um, and, and and like in a sense, the kind of the landscape and the nature where you keep going into it and finding new things. That the same is is true for me in terms of that meta narrative of faith and and. Uh, the stories of the Bible. And so I keep mining those and finding things in those that still have relevance and resonance to the stories that I write, whether in the stories I write, whether they've got anything to do explicitly um, with people of faith or not, um, there's still these kind of archetypal figures and, 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 and symbols and, uh, and understandings that I find just have resonance and meaning in all of the different stories that I tell, although about so many different things, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. We've covered a lot of turf here, the ideas, the characters. I want to ask you a little bit about, and, and I'm going to remind everyone that we're going to be coming to you shortly with any questions or comments that you have in the chat. I see a lot of a lot of action in the chat, so I'm hoping there'll, there'll be some nice questions for Marin in there. Um, but Marin, in terms of research, you, you spoke to us a bit, we're seeing notebooks, which uh, someone, Jenny in the chat has said is lovely, which it is. Could you tell us a little bit about um, the process of researching a book like this. I've, I've seen in your, you know, the, the appendix, as it were, just there's such a depth of, I think it's on your website, actually, a depth of reading on from anything from land reform to the poetry of Norman McCaig. How do you embark on a, on a project of this scale? Um, well, yeah, that's my research folder. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, it probably ends up you know, it can be a real trap, the research, because it is so fascinating uh, and, and there's so many different avenues and elements to it. Um, and so you can feel like you've never read enough or understood enough um, and it could go on and on forever. So I, I can find that that's partly why I suppose these books always take me a long time. There is a long research journey. And the, the challenge then also can be to then put it aside and Remember, I'm telling a story, I'm not writing a history book. Um, so yes, it's just a conversation as well between unfolding a story and then realizing, I don't know enough about this, so I need to go and find out. So there's all the kind of reading research side of it, which is, as you say, mentioned on the website. But actually the more important research was the going out and about in the community and talking to people who had lived here for a long time and um, being with people, observing their way of life and in particular shepherds. So um, a number of shepherds locally were kind enough to let me kind of trail along with them while they were lambing and that kind of thing. And particularly the Slimmon family in, in, in Lagan who were mentioned in the acknowledgements because they just let me come along on lots of things and watch what they were doing and ask dozens of questions and found me when I got lost <laughs> up a hill one time. And, you know, so, uh, and that for me was the best kind of research was, was really just, you know, watching people's life and how they how they worked and um, the things that, that matter to mm -hmm. people uh, in a very real way um, 
and so then just coming away again and, and writing it all down and yeah. listening and having lots of photos and things like that method so all writing. different kinds of levels of research part of that process yeah mm. a bit like method acting you were method writing sort of yeah well, yeah so. I suppose so yeah. <laughs> in yeah, some ways so there's some people in the audience here who are probably have some sort of a little cameo in there, a little um, sort, uh, maybe a, slightly differently to how they really are. But, you know, you've you've um, <laughs> they're maybe in there in some form refracted. Um, we, we do have some lovely questions, but I think before we get to those, uh, we're going to hear another little reading, I believe. Um, Marin, and that's live um, over to you. Okay, so as I said, this is the first time that our um, younger brother Sorley enters the narrative, and he is the second narrative voice of the novel. So Mo is the main one, um, but then we also have Sorley as well. So the chapter is called Exile. My name is Sorley McLean Monroe, and I am the shepherd boy made banker. I am the younger son with a hand on his brother's heel and I admit the exact nature of my wrongs. It is 2009, August, Thursday afternoon. Stepping onto the pavement outside the office block, I am nearly blinded by the sun as it bounces off the windows across the Thames. You, it says, you failure. You no longer belong here in the towers, the onwards and upwards of glass and steel, the radiant and rich, get out. I stand blinking holding my briefcase and archive box, the flotsam of 10 years in this office and 20 years climbing to it. My keys I have just given to the liquidator, a tall, thin man with gray trench coat and crooked nose, hands like claws. The first day he came, he stalked around the office, scribbling on a wad of papers, eyes darting. Leave all the paintings, they're mine. A nude, the fast breasts, a cityscape in slashes of black and orange, a digital creation of dots. Strident and expensive, I gloated over them. Not yours anymore, I believe. He tapped the inventory and slid his gaze to me. Now partnership property. I walked away. I am the bloody partnership. The only distinction, he said, so low I could barely hear him is that we can't sell you. Today, now it's over. I just wanted to give him the keys and go, but he insisted on sifting through my archive box, examining the papers, setting the pens aside like surgical instruments, holding my ram's horn letter opener aloft like it was infected. When his vulture eyes rested on the photograph of Annabelle, I pulled it back. Not for sale. I laid it in the box and slapped on the lid. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure, he whispered. Outside, I lower my eyes from the sun and try to breathe. A gust of wind lifts the flap of my jacket and sends a paper cup scudding past on the terrace where seagulls stalk the railings. I move the letter opener and photo to my briefcase, then walk across and throw the box in the river. The lid and a sheaf of papers take flight scattering across the water and backing up onto the terrace where the seagulls shriek. Someone yells. I walk away, past offices and banks, my usual cafes and bars, shops with dead-faced mannequins and handbags, past people lost and looking and lying in wait. I walk across littered parks and through arcades, turning corners, crossing roads, not knowing where I am going, not caring where I will stop. The bull and bear, one window boarded up, stains on the pavement. Never seen it before. In the jaundiced light and cooking fat smells, faces turn to me and colours ricochet around the jukebox. I order whiskies and sit in a corner. Waiting for oblivion, I think of Annabelle. Oh dear, poor Sorley. I know that everyone will be clapping if they weren't on mute. So let's, maybe we could all sort of um, replicate. There we go. Beautiful, Marin. thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions, which I will put to you on behalf of, uh, first of all, Bex asks, considering that much of the action of the novel takes place in relatively contained spaces, Shepherd's Cottage, The Ferryman, etc., could you see the novel working in a dramatic context, either stage or screen or film? 
Um, yes, and all, all screen offer deals warmly welcomed. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I think actually uh, my my um, the way I see things in lots of ways is quite cinematic. I, I, I see things very visually as I'm writing, um, and I I kind of really noticed when I saw the book in printed form that, that it it is very much built around all these scenes, lots and lots and lots and lots of short scenes. Um, so in lots of ways, yeah, I would love to see it that way. I think it would be challenging to do it as a stage play because so much of it is outdoors um, and involves, you know, hundreds of sheep and things like that. Um, but hey, all things are possible. And uh, having written for radio, I know, you know, radio paints the best pictures. Um, <laughs> I think David Ian Neville is amongst us. He's been the producer of my plays on the radio. So. Yeah, so anything's possible. Yeah, with a bit of imagination. Brilliant. I see someone um, advocating for Frances McDormand to play Mo. I heartily concur. That's a great, uh, a great thought. Great, well, actually. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> um, a sort of follow on question. Obviously, you've just mentioned radio, writing for radio and, and so on. Um, L. Harper asks As someone who writes plays, novels, and poems, how do you know which shape an idea belongs to? Lovely question. Yes, it is actually. Um, possibly the scale. Um, and I, when I was doing more writing of short stories, which I did before I'd started my first novel, I felt like a lot of them were trying to be novels. Some of them were just weren't, weren't containing themselves within, within the scope of a short story. Um, and yeah, that, uh, that's a really interesting question. And sometimes I don't know. I think if there's a very strong narrative, then it's not necessarily a poem, although some poems are very narrative. Um, and sometimes it's just trying things. Um, and, I, and I remember, you know, 100 years ago when I was doing my uh, education degree in drama was one of my majors, but I was also doing dance. And I remember our, our, one of our dance directors saying to us, so, so this idea, why are you dancing about it rather than writing a story or making a song, you know? And if that is it's kind of a bigger form of that same question, really, when, when you make art, why choosing the form that you are in? But there's that, that's, there's that incredibly inextricable relationship between content and form that as soon as you are it is a novel then that's starting to shape the very ideas and this kind of story in the way that you're telling it and so if you're going to dance it instead then it becomes a different kind of story as well mm -hmm. so the, the two sort of shape each other the decision about the sort of form it's taking and then the, the actual story that emerges is shaped by the form that that you've settled on um, but yeah, I think that sometimes it's maybe just gut feeling. Yeah, that you go one way. Yeah. Mm, fascinating to to have the menu of options to you know the vehicle it could be anything. Um, we've got a question from Michael who says, obviously Nan Shepherd has gone before in terms of the Cairngorms. Um, have you been influenced by her at all? And I would maybe add on to that if if maybe yes, if not though, what, who are the writers that have? given you permission, if you like, or have made you the writer you are, would you say? Um, okay, so I'll answer the second part of that question first, um, which perhaps kind of comes back to the earlier question you had about, about the epic. Um, so I, yeah, I, my reading is incredibly um, eclectic, and I've always liked all kinds of different things, but I have loved some of those really big uh, novels that cover a lot of ground and, and in lots of different ways. So whether that's um, Anna Karenina or whether that's Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children or Tim Winton's Cloud Street, you know, um, novels like that. And those are three very, very different novels, but they have a big cast. They cover a big scope in terms of time and geography. Um, so I love those kinds of things and getting completely lost in something really big and where the where the characters are are so alive and and vivid, um, but to the other part of the question about Nan Shepherd, yes, been um, quite influenced by her, and increasingly over the years. So I can't remember when I first read The Living Mountain, um, but the writing project that I'm working on at the moment, since finishing the writing of the novel, is actually a non-fiction response to Nan Shepherd. Um, it's also been commissioned by Polygon. 
um, called The Hidden Fires, A Kengom's Journey with Nan Shepherd. So that is a response not just to The Living Mountain, which is her nonfiction book about, about the, the range of mountains here for folks that haven't read it yet. But also I've found in that I've been responding to her novels and her poetry as well. Um, and she's known really for The Living Mountain. Now that's what she's most famous for. But at the time when she published her novel, she was being compared to Virginia Woolf uh, and in that kind of modernist movement. Um, so, you know, it was a shame that she really fell out of recognition and didn't deserve to. And her novels are almost, I think, as extraordinary in their capturing of landscape and some of the qualities of, of, of light in Scotland that, that she was in, you know, so fascinated by um, light, but also the earth. You know, there was that sense, and in some ways, that's why this book is called A Stone and Sky, not because of Nan Shepherd, but because in so many ways, I'm seeking to do some of the same kinds of things where dealing with what is transcendent, what is above and beyond us and calls us out of the everyday, but also what is earthed, what is the real and the tangible, and it's, it's both real, you know, but that sense that Nan Shepherd is, was always writing in that kind of paradoxical place of that which is beyond, that which is of light uh, and spirit, but also that which is of, of earth and body and bone and um, is so grounded. And, and, and I think even before I had encountered her work, those were some of the things that really fascinated me in, in writing. And so it's been incredible to, to recognize lots of those things in her as well and to be writing in response to those things. Yeah. Mm, wonderful. We've got one more question from uh, the audience, from V, um, who asks, I'd like to know which the very first lines you wrote were um, and whether the symbols that we mentioned were there uh, from the very beginning or otherwise. Um, so no, the, the symbols weren't there at the very beginning. So when I went back through this notebook and looked through, so there's this notebook and then there's also uh, another fat folder, which is that's all just kind of ideas and things as they emerge. So I think it was probably about a year into the process when I, I had this idea about the symbols of becoming the thread. Um, but the, the first words of it, I think, were this scene in the pub um, and the first words that I wrote which are no longer um, the first words of the, the book by any means. Um, and, that, and that actually, and I came across the point in the notebook when I kind of was inspired by that. So no, it can't have been the first words because it was quite a way into the notebook. We'd actually had an, a night at the pub where there'd been a, a band had come to play and the place was just heaving and there was lots of light and warmth and, and laughter and music and, high spirits in every sense of the word and coming home from that and thinking yes that that's something I want to capture because that is a big part of this community um, and that was a scene that at some point was the very um, first scene of the novel but it won't have been the first things I wrote I don't know I'd have to go back and <laughs> dig around in the in the digital files to, to work out what was the very the very first scene that I wrote yeah. But I can tell, looking back through the notebooks, that I was experimenting a lot in the early days with different points of view and different voices and um, different tenses and things like that, and trying to work out what 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 are the voices that carry this story. Lovely, Marion. I've got a final tiny little question, and then I, I think I've got to hand over to you. You've got some a, a last bit, a few words you want to say. Um, just having looked at an interview from some while ago, while the while the book was in, or you, maybe at the very beginning, back in back in 2013, 14, and you were writing this great big Scottish novel, and there were challenges with that. But coming out the other side, and tonight on launch night, and everybody's here, I just want to ask, what were the joys of writing this novel? I think you've touched on some of them with the music and the light and the, you know, and and the people. But could you articulate that? Do you think? I think the enormous privilege of being able to do it, you know, um, and there's a there's a lot a lot of people that are thanked in the back of this book, and I'll I'll come to some of those uh, at the end. But um, a big thank you to, to Alistair, who's been sitting off screen in the corner of the room here, and my husband, um, without whom I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. You know, it's it's been a big big novel and a big project, and it's taken a lot of time. And um, so without that generous patronage of the arts. Um, it wouldn't have been possible. So the, so the privilege, it's a luxury for, for me to have been able to give that amount of time and energy to, to the writing. 
So that's been a big joy um, because I knew from the beginning it was about the land. A big joy has been actually, you know, making sure that I take the time. You know, as a writer, you can often feel like you're never getting enough time at the desk. But actually think, yeah, I need to make sure I get enough time in the land just to be out there, to be in it, to see it, to breathe it. Um, so that has undoubtedly been one of the joys of that process is that it's just taken me higher up and deeper in. Um, and thinking I've, I'm, I'm writing about this place, I, I need to go and see it, you know, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, we all want to come and see it now too, um, I think, after hearing you speak about it so beautifully. I'm just going to wave the book at everyone, just a final little reminder. Uh, this beautiful, beautiful book, Inside and Out, is available um, uh, from your from, from your lovely bookmark um, in Granton, and, and the details are in the chat. I'm going to get out of the way and mute myself and hand over to Meryn now. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, there are a few thank yous uh, before we wrap up. Um, uh, a big thank you to Peggy for having, uh, you know, been the chair, uh, the host, the discussion meister for the evening. It's been a real joy and a privilege to have you on board. Thank you. Peggy is chair of Literature Alliance Scotland and director of the National Centre for Writing in Norwich. It's a real privilege to have you with us, Peggy. Thank you. Um, a thank you to Bookmark Marjorie and Granson, who is our, our host bookshop for the night. Um, and we'll be sending out lots of books to everybody. Um, and for the launch this evening, um, the video that we saw at the start was um, with permission of Jill Brown, and it's from a clippings that took place here in, in the Lagan Valley down the road. And it's all on YouTube if you want to watch the whole thing. So I'm sorry we had a few tech issues with that, but a thank you to her for that. Um, coming up, we're going to finish with another film. And so that's thank you to James Shooter of Scotland, the big picture for permission to use that film and Hamish Napier, whose music you will hear. And Hamish and myself and uh, Jill Brown of the Clippings film will be doing an event in September at the Badenoch Heritage Festival, hopefully in person. So uh, you can come along for some more music and film for that. Um, a big thank you to my agent, Catherine Summerhays, for helping to bring this into the world and the whole team at Berlin Polygon, Edward, Alison, Jan, Abby, Christian, Lucy, Catherine, and Fiona, Jamie, Senga, and Hugh. And hopefully I haven't missed out anybody. Um, and as I said, two whole pages of acknowledgements at the back for all of the people that have helped in lots of different ways with, with research and reading and um, love and care and support to bring the book into the world. So big thanks and love to all of them, especially Alistair, who I've just mentioned, uh, without whom nothing would have been possible. And then to, to my lovely boys, Sam and Luke, uh, to whom the book is dedicated uh, and for whom this place is home. Hi, guys, and thanks for coming and for being the best reasons to stop writing at the end of every day. And big thank you to all of you out there for coming along tonight. It just means so much to me that you're here. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And I hope that I can get the chance to see you in in-person events in time as they come. And there'll be hopefully some in Australia next year, maybe um, COVID permitting. Um, so, but yeah, meanwhile, it's just been such a huge, gift to me that you've given your time to come along tonight and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much and enjoy of stone and sky. Mm -hmm.